Hi everyone, welcome back to another uh, For Fun Flyer live episode, live from the Netherlands. A special welcome uh, to, uh, to all of you uh, from all uh, over the world. Uh, it's nice to uh, see that you're uh, tuned in uh, again to this uh, show. And uh, a special uh, uh, warm welcome to all the new subscribers that uh, joined my channel uh, the last uh, week. Uh, so actually I doubled the number of uh, subscribers uh, on my channel, so I'm uh, pretty proud of that. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's awesome that you, uh, you uh, joined the For Fun Flyer Club. Uh, also a special uh, uh, thanks and welcome to uh, the host of the chat. Uh, let's see if the chat is up and running. Uh, yeah, that's functioning as well. Uh, so yeah, uh, the host of the chats uh, today are uh, Kevin and uh, Niels. Uh, they did this uh, job uh, earlier uh, with uh, some earlier episodes uh, too. And uh, they're actually pilot friends of mine that uh, keep an eye on the chat. And uh, if you have uh, questions of uh, today's guests, then uh, just post them in the chat. Uh, and uh, we'll uh, do uh, your uh, questions and answering at uh, the Q&A section later on uh, uh, this, uh, this episode. Um, yeah, and about the chat, um, note that there's a, a delay, uh, a 10 to 20 seconds uh, delay uh, between posting uh, a chat and seeing it uh, back on the, the, the screen uh, because of the buffering of the video data. Uh, and yeah, of course, uh, if you want to highlight a certain chat, uh, know that you always can drop a super chat. Uh, that's a sponsored uh, chat. It uh, also helps a bit uh, uh, continuing uh, this, uh, this uh, vlogging uh, process. Uh, so if you want to buy me a cup of coffee during all the, the editing, then uh, you're more than welcome to drop a super chat. So uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's that. And uh, yeah, the, the tonight's guest is, uh, I'm pretty excited about, uh, about uh, tonight's guest uh, as well. Uh, yeah, he's just, uh, it's almost like a full circle kind of thing because uh, he is the, the main reason I started my YouTube channel. And uh, so let's, uh, let's go ahead and uh, see if he is online. So, uh, good evening. How's it going? Yeah, I'm fine. Uh, so let me uh, tune your uh, volumes really quick. So, uh, check one, two, yeah, check, check, it, check. Uh, good. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, cool. uh, everybody can read you. So, uh, yeah, well, welcome to the show. And uh, of, of course, uh, there are a lot of uh, folks that, that know who you are, of course, but uh, on the off chance that uh, people don't know who you are, can you uh, introduce yourself uh, to, uh, to the viewers? Sure, yeah. My name's Steve. I run a channel called Flight Chops, general aviation focus. Uh, really just the theme of it was trying to be a weekend warrior pilot, do the best I can, and sort of, obviously I don't fly professionally, but I try to strive to uh, be the best I can be and just share the debrief and learning as I grew as a pilot and continue to grow. And that's kind of the entire theme. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, that's a real, uh, real uh, short version of, of the, the uh, already seven years of uh, flogging you already did. And uh, we'll uh, go through all those years uh, later on in the, in the episode. But uh, yeah, you, you're, you're pretty uh, well known for your storytelling and also the, well, uh, actually the, the stuff you learn, you share and uh, in order for all the other pilots to, to learn uh, uh, as you learn it. I think that that's, that's the best way to describe it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, um, uh, to begin uh, with, uh, uh, your complete story of, of flight shows, uh, because that's the name of your channel, obviously, uh, um, can you, uh, share how you started with aviation, uh, the, when and where did you start, uh, flying? So I always knew I wanted to be a pilot. It was those like, these things, you know, there's not a lot of accidental pilots. You kind of, it's just one of those things you know you want to do. So ever since I was as young as I can remember, it's always been wanting to fly, but I didn't have a family member beyond my grandfather who flew Spitfires, but I didn't really get to meet him. Yeah, he died when I was quite young. Okay. And I, well, I mean, I met him, but I didn't get to talk to him about flying in any real way. So ultimately, I had to kind of do it myself. So, I mean, the short version of that story is I tried with Air Cadets when I was 12 didn't really wasn't really for me that kind of style of learning it was more military focused and in the end I got a part-time job and saved the money when I was in my mid-teens and then I kind of switched gears and bought a car with that money 1985 Volkswagen Scirocco instead of my private <laughs> license okay. uh, and then it was in university uh, between first and second year film school okay. that I actually just buckled down and did it and got the private. So I got the first, I did soaring in the summer of the, that year, 95, and then got solo in the sailplane, Schweitzer 233, and then switched into uh, power flying in the fall and by the winter of, so I, I did my private flight test, I believe it was in February of 
96. So I got my private then. Okay. Uh huh. Okay. So yeah, that's uh, that, that's that, that's a pretty amazing story. So and then w when did you uh, actually uh, started flight shops? So flight shops really was inspired by. So I got my license in '96, and then quickly realized as a poor college student it was difficult to maintain currency, and I really maintained it at a bare minimum. Um, so really, what it came down to was how do I stay current? And the battle of doing that, I lost that battle. Kind of, it fell off my regular monthly get it done thing when I was getting the house and having a baby and getting married and all those things. So around 2004, I lost currency and didn't pick it back up until 2009. But in that time, those, those five, I went right almost a full five years without flying. And, uh, in Canada, as long as you get it, get some PIC logged again within five years, it's not as much of a hoops to jump through to get your license it's not that you lose it per se but you have a lot to do to kind of have it effective so i was able to do that i i, I kind of voluntarily did a bunch of recurrency training and in that period of time between 2005 and 2009 a bunch of really key things happened in the world of aviation the main one was the ipad and, and for flight became a thing and um I never liked paper charts. I never enjoyed that aspect of flying and trying to use a pencil and do diversions and have the E6B on your lap and trying to manage yeah, a chart. Yeah. I always found that stressful, having moved from soaring where I was just listening. I mean, you could tell your airspeed by listening to the wind. Oh, yeah. And then all of a sudden, you have all these instruments in front of you. It's loud and shaking, and you got this paper chart you're fighting with. So when, the, when the, my wife got me the iPad for Christmas 2009 when I was trying to get recurrent, and GoPros had become a thing, so I was able to debrief my flights privately with the GoPro. Oh, yeah. And uh, I started kind of sharing those debriefs with some friends as I was re getting night current and all those things and remembering how to land at night and get the center line and all that stuff. Um, and then even listening to ATC with the GoPro hooked up so I could review my radio work and catch mistakes or whatever. One of the early debriefs that really kind of showed me the value of it was flying with a friend. And I noticed the controller was kind of cranky with me. I was flying over the city, doing a city tour. And I was like, why is this controller cranky? And then when I got home and debriefed it, I could see that it was because this was the third time he was trying to call me uh, because the pastor had been talking and I was missing the calls. Okay, yeah. If I didn't debrief that, I would not have noticed that. And so I, I always do the thing where I tell my pastor, if I raise my finger, it means stop talking. I need to hear the radio. Oh, yeah. But that um, helped me remember, I guess I didn't do a good enough job briefing that. And, you know, so that was a nugget that I took from a debrief that I would not have got if I could not have looked at the footage. Okay. Because up until that point, I would, I would still make detailed notes of my flights, but you can only write down what you can remember if you're making notes. Yeah. Uh -huh. There's nothing better than debriefing a video. So that was really the birth of, of figuring out the value of the debrief on video and then deciding if I was going to share it by adding some context and editing. I saw a lot of things on YouTube that had lacking context, so I felt like there was value there to put something out with context to say, look, I'm not an instructor, but here I am learning something and sharing that, that nugget of I don't want I, well, wisdom. I don't really want to claim to be uh, authoritative, but it's like this is something I learned, and here it is. You can see for yourself. and. And that really evolved the whole thing. The brand was based on a joke, honestly. Uh, I had a mustache going for a charity. Yeah. We did this thing called Movember here. Oh, yeah. And a bunch of my friends kind of jamming on ideas. I play the drums, so work on chops for music oh, yeah. jump that's practicing. So it really was natural to just call it Flight Chops and brand it. And the original logo is, is literally a cartoon that my friend drew on a napkin. It's, it's, we turned it into more of a corporate brand yeah. looking thing when it started to get some traction a couple of years later but in the beginning it was 100 percent no need or desire to make revenue out of it it was purely my own private debrief that i shared publicly and just kind of making content yeah. obviously i was in the film industry so this was kind of my side project with some filmmaking friends that helped me kind of up the game a little bit of what was on YouTube at that time in aviation. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, because uh, the, the, perhaps it's, it's now nice to to, to see uh, what what it takes to to make an episode. Uh, because uh, I want to uh, dive into the rest of the history of you uh, uh, be, uh, doing seven years of, of flight jobs. But before we uh, dive into that, uh, uh, can you describe how a, a typical production day looks like? Because I think, uh, and I know as a vlogger myself, that it's just a lot of work, uh, like planning, etc. Can, can you? Can can you take us along in, in like like a brief kind of uh, 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 yeah like like a day a production day in the life of flight shops? 
Yeah, I mean, the short answer is there isn't a typical day. Okay. It, it's either um, really not planned or thought out at all. It's just grab the cameras because I'm going to fly and I'm going to debrief anyway. And then I find some value. Some of the most valuable ones have come from that where I didn't plan to shoot anything. Uh, this this clip you're showing here is one of the early ones that I shot with the crew. And uh, this was a planned shoot where we were doing the winterization of the Super Cub. So this is kind of where I introduced my crew to the um, community for the first time. And I kind of had James, my director friend there, walk into the shot. And then he reveals Brock, I think, in a second here, oh, yeah. who was operating the crane that we borrowed that day because oh, we yeah. did a thing about winterizing the engine of the Super Cub. Okay. Um, yeah. But previously, it's, oh, yeah, I'm showing my cameras and kind of oh. talking about the process there. Um, typically, the planning is either going to be a production like this where it's really we're planning to shoot a very specific thing and we have the crew out there that we know it's almost like a film production uh, if I'm doing something where it's a simple flight that I don't have a filmmaking mission. And I do very carefully plan not to be a filmmaker if I am going to be PIC. So yeah, there's Brock yeah. kind of oh, yeah. introducing him. Oh, yeah. um, those two guys went to film school with me in the 90s and that's really where we've always been friends and they both helped me kind of brand it and figure it out and they were there from the very beginning kind of helping me shoot stuff if I was going to do something more elaborate like an early one that they came out to shoot was ski flying okay. where we went and flew and learned how to land in the snow so that was a case where I was training I knew that I was going to want extra b-roll so there's you know bring Brock with a good lens and get him really helping me get those shots I was not PIC because I was being trained so right. that's a case where I can afford to be a filmmaker and a pilot at the same time because I'm not I've got a safety pilot I'm not PIC yeah. if I'm PIC I really don't want to be distracted so yeah. I don't plan the filming comes very secondary the the cameras are part of my pre-flight I set it and forget it right. if I happen to glance at one at some point during the flight and I don't see the red light because the battery died or the card got full or something yeah I just have to I have to ignore it like it, yeah. that's my SOP yeah I don't allow the distraction because I do uh, have concerns about people thinking about their selfies while they're flying and that's yeah, not no. it's not okay yeah. and it, even when I started flying the Harvard the T6 I didn't even put a camera facing me uh, once I was solo yeah. I just was like I don't want anything in my way yeah, exactly. this is not about me yeah. uh, so I've only recently got the camera up there because I started flying with the helmet and oh, yeah. uh, I can yeah. kind of show the value of the helmet and talk about that. Um, but again, if I'm actually flying, I'm not. The, I'll do the talk to the camera stuff before or after. It's not going to be during the flight. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So I don't know that I'm answering your question exactly, yeah, yeah. but a day in the life, it really depends on what we're doing. Some of the okay. really elaborate stuff, like flying with the Coast Guard, was a very extensive project that involved oh, yeah. bringing the crew, yeah. traveling, being out there for a weekend. Oh, yeah. Heavy, heavy production side, most more like a TV world production plan yeah. uh, versus a training thing like the ski flying where it's a one day thing it's local we're going to shoot a debrief and a briefing and we're going to shoot the actual training and then I'll go home and figure out what I got so oh, yeah. at any given time it's not a particular formula of how it's going to get done it's kind of based on what the project is okay yeah and uh, those those guys uh, still help you produce uh, the, the videos or or did they help you shoot, uh, shoot yeah. it uh, or <clears throat> they're still around I don't I don't bring them out as often as I used to, mostly because they're both so busy and successful as filmmakers and okay. I can't <laughs> afford to pay what they're worth and I don't want to ask for favors anymore. Uh, okay, I still, I, I pay them, yeah. but um, not what they're worth. In the, in the early days, they did it for free and then uh, we we settled on a budget that they, I, I just don't want to, ask. I, I'm sure they would, oh, yeah. but I don't want to ask. Their, you know, they helped me figure out what it was in the early days. Yeah. and. You know, if I'm going to bring them out and make sure I'm not conflicting with one of their other jobs, like they came out to the Coast Guard yeah. shoot, which wasn't that long ago. Okay, yeah. Uh -huh. um, so they're definitely uh, still a part of the team, and I still talk to them. I show them cuts and, and get their thoughts on things, but I don't okay. bring them out for most of the shoots anymore. Uh, okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. It's nice to have a glimpse of, of the world behind flight shops. So that's uh, I don't know. Perhaps uh, you could do an episode about making your episodes. That would be nice, like a behind the scenes kind of a thing. But uh, uh, I, think I like be a niche that might be interested in yeah, that. But exactly. I don't. I don't plan to do that. I might do that for Patreon or something like that for okay. the really hardcore 
supporter fans, but like, like me, honestly, I don't think the majority of the community cares. <laughs> I think they just want to see the content, and yeah. and I don't really want to make it about me, honestly. Yeah. No, no, no. I think you you have a really honest uh, uh, YouTube channel, and, and you talk what 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 matters, etc. Et so uh, yeah. Uh, uh, speaking about uh, the episodes, uh, I uh, made a pretty elaborate uh, planning. You all, uh, you also. Uh, yeah, but uh, am I running too long on those answers already? <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm trying, no. I'm, I'm trying to glance over here also at yeah. my other monitor just yeah. to see the chat. So that's yeah. why I'm looking to the side if so, anyone's wondering. So yeah, the, the, the script I sent you, that, that's, that's a sign of me uh, doing my normal stuff. I'm pretty elaborate on, on everything I do, but so... <laughs> but, okay, uh, yeah. just keep, keep, keep nudging me to move things yeah. along. So Oh yeah, no, no problem. So yeah, for for the people that uh, don't know about uh, the script, uh, I uh, uh, I made a, like a like a little schedule, and uh, what I want to do is to show one uh, a video uh, that that has a lot of view counts on your channel, and we can discuss that 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 uh, particular video clip a real real short. And uh, this actually this is one of the first videos, so let me uh, cue that in. So this is uh, the I think your your breakthrough as a YouTube channel. Is it correct? Um, uh, the one, the flying VFR and IMC was probably the first one that got major viral, uh, but this one was quite okay. close to that time period, whereas, and again, this was, that's James, my director friend in the back, that's his girlfriend in the front. Okay. She's very afraid of flying, so we had a plan to take her flying and make her feel better on beautiful night over Toronto, sunset, yeah. calm, it should have been great, and that was the concept, it was going to be a, like, fluffy, fun, easy peasy. I just thought this, I've done this a million times. Oh, it's yeah. going to be great. Didn't work, man. She was so scared. It didn't stop being scared. Oh. And uh, this was the case also. We didn't plan for the story that became the story. Uh, okay. uh -huh. I, was, I was I was, very distracted by how scared she was. And I couldn't, I couldn't, nothing I worked, no, none of my tricks worked to make her feel better. So I just cut it short. And because of where we are in Toronto, there's Dash 8s, which are large turbo props constantly coming in. Oh, yeah. Um, I kind of asked for sequence. I don't want to. I didn't declare an emergency or anything like that. But I think I made it clear to the controller, like I kind of just want to get in. So he squeezed me in between dash eights, which is not a. It's not unusual for them to do that. Okay. But it was tight, and he gave me the wake turbulence advisory okay. warning, which I'm used to getting. Yeah. And the procedure is you fly a steeper approach, and you plan to land beyond the touchdown point of the aircraft with the wake. Yeah. No big deal, long yeah. runway. Uh -huh. However. Um, and I remember acknowledging the wake advisory and everything. Like, this is us on the way in. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and returning base basically there to once the water will be turning final. And there's a dash eight oh, yeah. that's coming, and there's a dash eight that I'm squeezing in between two. Yeah. Okay. And uh, uh -huh. yeah. I, just, I just flew a normal approach. Like, I completely failed to do the uh, procedure for the wake, and I'm lucky. Uh -huh. So all of a sudden, we went from very, very, very calm. And I, I think I made an arrow pointing at it. As you can see, at those early days, I didn't do very much graphics or production value. It was a very simple cut, yeah, this well, one. Yeah. When it works, it works. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, um, but anyways, I hit the wake. And it, it went from being very, very, very calm to, like, very violent. Yeah. <laughs> in comparison to the calm, to be yeah. clear, it wasn't severe. And I've no, got no. some people in the comments say, this is nothing. It's like, look, here's the deal. I hit the wake. Yeah. And it, it could have flipped us upside down at 50 feet AGL and killed us. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. yes, it wasn't severe. But yeah. the fact of the matter is I, I put myself at the mercy of the wake yeah. Oh, yeah. because, of a, because of, of a distraction, because of failing to follow the procedure. And anyway, yeah. it, it was a great debrief of, uh -huh. of uh, that moment of, of how distracting a passenger can be. So that, that was an early video that got some good traction. Oh, yeah. And again, like exposing a mistake. And I, I got beat up in the comments, people telling me it was terrible, bad. Da, da, da. It's like, well, yeah, okay. But I mean, <laughs> yeah. you can either share it or yeah. not. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. so I stand behind it and, yeah. you know, I share mistakes and that's that's what the channel's about. Yeah, exactly. And then you, you, you said it earlier on uh, that, that the, the video that uh, got a lot of traction too was uh, about the same time period. Yeah, but this one. Th 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 this was the 2014. Uh, if I'm correct. Yeah, this is kind of the moment that I decided to get my instrument ratings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can um, tell. Yeah. This was supposed to be a beautiful day, and it was a beautiful day. This, What you're seeing here is a lake effect snow squall. And yeah. it, within 10 miles of that, it was clear blue sky. Okay. Um, oh. this, this was on the way home after flying out to my other airport that I fly a different airplane. And it was kind of a complex story with a friend. And we were going to do fly two different airplanes. And we had this mission. We left our cars at one place. It put us in a position of get the rightest to get back. Oh, yeah. 
and and I, I pushed into that. Yeah. So there's how clear it was. Oh wow. Right. Yeah. Away, away, away from, This only took minutes to get into the sprawl, which became pretty much instrument conditions. Yeah. Um, it, it it didn't go full IMC, but it could have. And uh, I just shared the process of what it of how it lulls you, lures you, lulls you into. Yeah a trap of slowly finding yourself going VFR to IMC. And this is a very common killer of a lot of pilots where they push, 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 all of a sudden they're in IMC. Yeah, exactly. And now they're, now they're fighting for their lives to stay level Yeah, yeah. Um, as a VFR pilot. So I shared that one and I, I shared the footage with my instructor to say, look, here's what happened. Like, I mean, was this illegal? Like what? And I mean, the technical, you know, it wasn't exactly a reg bust. It was as close as it could have been to that. Yeah. Um, but I share, I shared the, I shared it with context. That yeah. was probably the most editing I put at that time. Okay. I, in the early days, I committed to not more than three hours of editing, which is why the early ones with MJ, the, that first Wake Turbulence Encounter video, yeah. was not very good production value yeah. in the post because I just could not afford to take the time because that was my day job. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But with that one, because of the amount of context I felt was necessary yeah. to share that kind of really serious thing, yeah. I did edit. I think I, I think I put in the video. I talked about it. It was like 20 hours, which now I spend minimum 40 on an episode of editing. Yeah, but yeah. at yeah. that time, that was a lot to put in because I, the channel was very small yeah. at that time. Yeah. But I, I just felt like I wanted to share that with as much context as possible yeah. to make it clear. Like even though we didn't go full IMC, it was very scary, and uh, you know it could have been bad. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, let's let's move on to 2014. That's uh, that's a one year uh, further. That's a disc clip. That was about uh, the tail wheel flying training. I I think is that correct? Yeah, it's funny. When I started the channel, I remember thinking, man, I wish I had this figured out to have covered my my private training because I you know it would have been so nice to share with so many cameras and everything. Yeah. But the truth is, it really was. When I got to do tailwheel, that was where I learned how to fly. To be honest, okay. And and I did I did share it in all of its like at that point I had flight chops really figured out. Okay. So I had the guys helping me shoot this B roll and stuff. The guys are here for this. Really, that's my first tailwheel lesson yeah. right there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, really sharing the details of that, right down to like seeing the camera on my feet to see the pedals related to the rudder deflection. Oh yeah. And yeah. And I got very good capture of when I was solo, my first time really getting my scared of, of I, I really scared myself yeah. at one point, almost ground looping, wow. which I think this is the footage that's yeah. So I got graphics made by a buddy of mine that's demonstrating what a ground loop looks like. Oh yeah. <laughs> and then and then in an episode, I almost ground looped the Super Cub in a crosswind at one oh, point. Oh yeah, 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 I know. Got great, great, great footage of that. <laughs> I dropped a whole bunch of F-bombs and that was real. <laughs> I put a warning like before, that, and like this, have the kids leave the room because this is gonna get, <laughs> F bombs because I really thought <laughs> at the time like the the airport was under construction and there were big piles of dirt like six feet high yeah and if I I was heading toward that and you know, here's a ground loop of an actual steerman yeah, showing yeah, how yeah. It, it looks all fine it looks yeah, all fine yeah, and all yeah, of a sudden yeah. it's not fine yeah the minute that the ground loop starts oh, it's boy. over oh. right there you can't oh. fix it oh. and you're going wherever the plane is oh. pointing and you're damp like the, the tire got ripped off the rim the wingtip hit oh. oftentimes this stuff results in a prop strike. It can also result in flipping over, yeah, especially yeah. in something like a T6. If you ground loop a T6, yeah. it's probable to flip it right over. Okay. okay. So, uh, yeah, that's tailwheel flying. But I covered all of that stuff, and it was really uh, fun to share. That yeah. that was the first real major uh, beyond going, you know, just sharing a debrief in a 172. Yeah. Moving to tailwheel was was where I kind of realized, like, this is flying. This I, I always knew it was something I wanted to do. I didn't fully understand how much yeah. fundamentally better it would make me to do it. Okay. Yeah. And then sharing that learning process was really rewarding. Yeah. So that was uh, 2015, uh, to be uh, correct, uh, at least uh, seeing my notes. And this was 2016. Can you uh, share something on, on this video? This was uh, one of my favorites, too. Uh, it's about the TBM. Yeah, so this is a friend of mine. He's a local that uh, has been uh, a longtime fan and supporter. And it's interesting. He reached out to me a really long time before we even shot together, asking me, do you think your viewers would like to kind of really learn about flying with TBM? And I was like, yeah, how how is that possible? Is that like, how do we, we're not going to go do it these circuits with it. What are we going to do with this thing? <laughs> so it, anyway, he explained he was just in a lucky situation where this is his private airplane. Okay, wow. Um, uh, he's very successful, and uh, yeah. we ended up taking a long time to figure out a mission. In the end, it was to fly to Rochester to get my US PPL 
paperwork done, ah, okay. which was the because I have Canadian PPL and I had to get a conversion. Okay. Uh -huh. For so, and what was interesting was he was actually kind of disappointed where he's like, well, that's not really okay. It's not really a big enough mission. <laughs> like, okay, I don't want to ask you to fly me. In in the end, we did another one. The next thing we did was fly to Winnipeg from Toronto, which is halfway across Canada, which is a significant distance. Yeah. Like. I can't remember the exact distance, but it's a lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah that was showing the Rochester just go across Lake Ontario. It's a tiny oh, yeah. trip for that airplane. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I was going to rent a 172 to do it, but I wouldn't have gone over open water, and it was the winter, so yeah, it saved me a lot of stress to just do it with him in that airplane. But I don't even think we went above 12,000 feet for that. Okay. Uh -huh. um, when we flew to Winnipeg, we did a big cross country, and, and we had a mission to do there. And uh, that was the case where we took it to the service ceiling, 31,000. Yeah really showed what it could do and he yeah. now flies a, a phenom 300 oh yeah yeah so i was i was with him learning i was doing my instrument training while he was getting his type rating in that airplane and that was fun to kind of watch him grow and yeah. how he went from only having a single ifr that's all he had single engine ifr yeah when he was flying the tbm because that's all you need you don't need a type rating for the tbm okay then he then he got the opportunity to fly the phenom which required a significant amount of more ratings yeah. he went and got his multi ifr commercial atpl and the type rating for the phenom and he did all of it in like three months <laughs> this this guy really made Incredible. me feel uh he's like a machine very <laughs> inferior because yeah. it was taking me like five years to get my single ifr but yeah, you know yeah. it is what it is yeah, i was exactly. you know yeah. doing a lot of different things so yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, the, 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 that's that's actually an episode I ex excluded from the list because I had to make some choices. But the, that separate that uh, that separate episode on the Phenom uh, Whiskey Tango Fox that is uh, actually one of my personal favorites. Uh, the, the, mm -hmm. Also because of the, of the call sign Whiskey Tango Fox. Yeah, <laughs> that's always been a, the owner specifically wanted that call sign. And ATC very often laughs when they say WTF. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, cool. Yeah, but uh, moving on to uh, I think uh, this is uh, probably the the most famous, uh, uh, the most famous uh, uh, episode of uh, of uh, your channel, the the B twenty nine Super Fortress, yep. I guess that 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 that, yeah, that, that hit, hit hit like millions of views, right? Yeah, it's at seven point five million. <laughs> so that that one is definitely the the most popular video. Um, it, it was, and this is a case where. I was at Air Venture and I did have my crew. However, because of the way the schedule worked out, yeah. this thing kept getting pushed because of the weather and so on. So the crew and I, I, we were all booked to fly home on the Sunday, but this ended up getting booked finally to go for the Sunday. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So my crew, I just sent them on the airline tickets home and I burned my airline ticket and stayed to do this without them. So this whole thing was done without the crew. I got a favor from a local friend, Chris Palmer, who runs the Angle Attack channel. And Dion Mitten, who is an Instagrammer pilot, who happened to also be there. So they were able to help me kind of, I just handed them cameras and they had their own cameras and they helped me film it. Okay, yeah. But this this was a very uh, winged production. I mean, it was no real planning. I didn't know, what, you know, I didn't have a lot of time to rig. And then ironically, all of a sudden there was all of this time because we had to wait for the weather. So in the end, uh, it was... I just pulled it off. I didn't quite know how to do the storytelling on this one either because normally it's about stick time uh, uh -huh, yeah. and I couldn't get stick time in this thing. Oh, okay. So I decided, they asked me like, where, where would you want to be? And I said, I want to be in a spot where I'm the most free to move if I'm allowed. And they said, okay, if you're in the middle yeah. section, then once, once we take off and we're stabilized, you can unbuckle and go. Mm. And I was like, all right, that's my plan. Then I'm going to crawl around every single spot <laughs> in this airplane while it's flying. Yeah, and I cool. did, and I went through the tube because that's pressurized oh, yeah. to get above the bomb bay. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was fun. And I, I really had no idea that, that it would do as well as it did. And it's funny, I sat on this footage for almost a year because it was just in the pile of stuff to edit from that year, 2016. Okay. Uh -huh. And yeah, it blew up. It, it still gets thousands of views per day. Yeah, incredible. Yeah, I liked it a lot too, but uh, yeah, I can imagine. And, and the, 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 the amount of coordination between, between the, those crew members is, uh, is, is insane. Uh, the, the, you have to coordinate, coordinate everything, like uh, manifold pressure and RPMs, etc. It's just just insane yeah like well the engineer runs the engines oh yeah the pilots do have they have throttles they have access to but they don't set them yeah. 
the engineer does all that yeah. typically for them. They just ask for sat power settings and then he sets. Yeah, them yeah, exactly. And he's behind them. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's uh, that's uh, that's one of my favorite episodes too. And uh, but uh, yeah, let's let's move on because otherwise uh, we won't make it to the to the, to the whole list. Uh, but uh, yeah, that was uh, 2017 or when it was uh, published. And uh, so, well, yeah. yeah, it was. It happened in 16. I, I guess I published it right before the following Ash of 17. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, and uh, it was uh, an episode of 2018, a really uh, popular one. And I think this is one of the most proud moments of, of your life, I guess. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, as a pilot, I never thought I would get to fly a T6, let alone solo yeah. it. So, um, and this was when I first began thinking about tailwheel flying. I went to a local place that did offer a ground school and did have the training in these airplanes. And I did that in 2000 okay. as a young, thinking I knew stuff pilot and I didn't have tailwheel yet. And I really assumed, and there's my grandfather oh, yeah. who flew the Spitfires. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I assumed that all I needed to do was get the checkbox of tailwheel and then I could just go train this thing, right? <laughs> so, um, not understanding uh, this is a tailwheel on steroids. Yeah, oh yeah. Basically, yeah. six 6,000 pounds. So yeah, walking up that thing, it just gets bigger and bigger as you get closer and closer. Yeah. It's large, 6,000 pound tail dragger. I mean, that's a lot of airplane. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The reason why it was used for the World War II trainer for the fighters, and most of the guys that I've talked to that fly Mustangs and Spitfires, have yeah. said that you know the T6 is harder. Okay. Well, I guess for a reason because it, it set you up for success in the fighters, which were just easier to fly. Ah, okay, I see. And uh, easier to ground handle and everything apparently. Okay. Yeah. So um, yeah, to get access and then to get the training yeah. and then to get signed off. And ironically, that currently is the only airplane that I'm current in. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I'm just kind of fighting to maintain currency even during this weird time. Yeah. I just I went and flew it a few days ago. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I'm still current on it and. Uh, yeah, it's 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 very uh, a proud moment yeah. to be able to call myself a T6 pilot for yeah, sure. Yeah, and then especially that that, that little uh, little voiceover of that uh, that ATC uh, com uh, bit you you put in uh, uh, that that little uh, reference to to your grand uh, grandfather that that was uh, pretty uh, pretty emotional too. Uh, I saw a lot of uh, comments in the comment section of this episode that that they really like that that segue too. Yeah, I mean, my grandfather flew Spitfires. That was the inspiration for me to get up. To become a pilot, knowing that and thinking about that, and and the goal obviously, long term, is to get the Spitfire checkout. Yeah. And this is a, you you just simply can't do that without the T6. Okay. You have to have T6 time. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a pretty impressive episode. So uh, uh, moving on to the next year, this was uh, last year. One of two uh, uh, videos I want to share about the 2019. This was a combination of uh, two DC3 kind of uh, projects. Uh, one of, of course, Mikey McBride with the plane savers, we all know him, and uh, one of uh, a para parachute drop uh, event. What, what was that all about? Right. So um, this fleet. The D-Day squadron went over and actually did reenact the D-Day drop. So they were practicing at the AOPA Frederick Flying, which is where I went, and I filmed that stuff. And then oh, yeah. that was before D-Day. And then on actual D-Day, Mikey was able to pull off getting yeah. his that airplane DTD yeah. to fly. Yeah. So um, I went there in Montreal when they actually flew and. Uh, then I intercut the two because they're both E-Day stories. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I'm really proud of this one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it's a really good story, and it, it's amazing that Mikey pulled that off. Yeah. It's amazing that the D-Day squadron pulled it off. They flew all the way over the ocean with the fleet yeah. of those DC-3s. Yeah. I mean, they did it. Yeah, insane. Just like, so it wasn't just reenacting the drop. They actually flew across the ocean. Yeah. It kind of simulated what really happened. Yeah. It's impressive. Yeah, 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 impressive. Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, I uh, I uh, followed uh, the story of Mikey McBride, of course, with plane sailors like uh, every day. It was almost like a like a daily drug kind of thing. But yeah, it's it's impressive. He he, he pulled it off in so, 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 such a short uh, period of time uh, that uh, that uh, whole restoration because. Uh, to be honest, I, I, I never thought it would, would, would fly again uh, seeing, seeing uh, the, the airplane like that. But uh, yeah, it was really impressive. Oh yeah, he's got an amazing team. I thought the same thing. Yeah. I thought it was crazy when he proposed doing that. Yeah. I, I went down and, and was there for the day they ran the engines, yeah. which was like a month before. I think it was May 6th, actually. I think it was literally a month before yeah. June 6th, D-Day. Yeah. And uh, 
I was like, good luck, man. I don't see how this is possible. The wings, the, like, yeah, they had the engines running, but the wings are still off and lots more work to do. Yeah. Uh -huh. But they did yeah. it. And, and not only did they do it, but Mikey pulled off vlogging it on a daily yeah. basis, which is insane. That is a slog, yeah. man. Like, so yeah. he pulled it off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The doom, doom, uh, doom vlogs myself. It's, uh, yeah, I, I know that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a pretty uh, impressive uh, uh, feed so uh, uh, yeah and uh, I, I uh, selected another clip of uh, 2019 um, showing uh, the start of a, a different uh, kind of uh, uh, series of vlogs uh, that's because uh, you uh, are now the, the owner and builder of an RV14 right yeah so this is also a cool organic kind of thing that goes back to my early days I've been carrying around a picture of a RV7 since 2001 my inkjet printer and i proudly printed that picture when they launched that airplane and i just felt like that was the perfect it's it's just so much more airplane than a cessna uh -huh. or a piper uh -huh. that you would typically see as your ga you know 172 or a warrior yeah it's just such a sleek looking thing with the canopy and the stick and i mean they're just so well thought out and they're not expensive so that was my goal was to i thought this is the perfect almost you know no one airplane can do everything but it's it the rv14 which is what i ultimately landed on is basically the bigger version of the seven oh, yeah. it's got a good payload you, you put in a significant amount of bags oh, yeah. obviously you're limited to two people with two seats yeah. but most of my flying is with two people yeah, yeah. Uh, it's aerobatic it's tailwheel and it's capable of landing on you know i wouldn't put it on a really bumpy rough strip with where you'd want to put you know a ton of tires but you can definitely take it into a place where you wouldn't want to go with a Mooney or, or something with a nose wheel. Oh, no. um, and it's fast. Yeah. So it's a good cross country platform. It's aerobatic. So to be able to make this happen and we're doing this build vlog, uh, that's been a pretty cool sideline project. Yeah. So 2019 was a busy year trying to manage that line of content combined with the regular content. And then also I was finishing the instrument reading yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, the, and then the instrument vlog uh, at the same time. Yeah. So 2019 was a year of like multiple streams of content, trying to manage yeah. all that stuff while also actually doing those yeah, things. Yeah, insane. Weren't you uh, never at the, at the brink of going going uh, mad, like like doing uh, the, all that stuff uh, at the same time? It, it just it, it seems like like a pretty, yeah. pretty stressful time. No, there's no question that traveling that much to shoot those things while also actually taking on the literally trying to build an airplane and literally trying to get my instrument rating which to me, um, not a good student traditionally. So that was very, absolutely, that was the hardest thing I've ever yeah. done is to get through the instrument written tests, yeah, yeah. which I did fail the first time I tried and it was very discouraging. That was like in 2018, I almost took a whole year off yeah. before I went and faced that test again. Yeah. And I kind of used the vlog as like a way to hold myself accountable. Everyone knew I was working on it for a long time because I would do videos about the instrument training intermittently mixed with other things, but it, I couldn't really focus. Yeah. So I decided I'm going to make this vlog, which is less production value. Ironically, I don't think I ever succeeded at not putting more effort into editing than I should have. But anyway, I did try to make it more raw of a vlog. You just say, here's what it feels like to try to do this yeah. while you're having, like, I'm not a college student. Yeah. It's not full time. So I'm trying to fit this in with other yeah. things. Uh -huh. It was very difficult, yeah. no doubt. And then, of course, the community mostly got it, but there would still be consistent people that would tease and, uh, you know, I wouldn't say they were haters per yeah. se, but there were some that were like, this guy's never going to get this okay. done, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, and that was difficult yeah. because they don't, they don't know, or, I mean, most people got it, but it's a, yeah, I had a lot going on. Yeah. So it was yeah. very difficult to do that publicly. Um, but I got to a point where it had been five years. So I'm like, I got to just yeah. suck it up. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then of course, the only time that I really could do it was the winter and around here, that's a very difficult time to fly oh, yeah. because of icing risk. Yeah. Uh -huh. But it is what it is. I couldn't do it in the summer because of all the travel that I typically would be doing. Um, yeah. So it was, it dragged. I really focused hard for final flight test prep in November of 2019, really thinking I can pull this off before 2020. Yeah. And it just didn't work. I, I canceled the flight test five times. It was the sixth oh, time okay. of booking it to finally do it. And that was January 7th, 2020, yeah. finally getting it yeah. done. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was a difficult, and with the build, I do have a very unique situation where it's at the museum where I fly the warbirds oh, yeah. that we're building it. We have access to a really good facility, lots of tools, oh, yeah. uh -huh. and a really, a really great team of retired guys that are super keen to help. Okay. And 
frankly, it's me helping them, honestly. Like we're, <laughs> they're doing most of the grunt work yeah. because they're there and I'm not there as often as they are. And I try my best to be there <laughs> and I'm filming the process. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's a very unique situation how fast we're banging that airplane out. But it's, yeah. I think we're still in shape to be flying it by January of 21, okay. even though this whole Corona thing has really yeah. <laughs> slowed us down. Yeah. Um, we were still so far ahead that I don't think it's going to be that big of a delay. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to, to, to that airplane uh, hitting the sky. So yeah, uh, beautiful. And uh, yeah, the, the, uh, to uh, jump forward uh, to uh, current, uh, current uh, time, it's uh, one of your most recent, I, I believe uh, the, the most recent uh, videos uh, you, you published, yep. right? So the irony here is this was shot in July of 2018. Okay. Shot over the summer solstice in Alaska. And this was such a massive shoot. Um, I hired a local guy from the West Coast to fly out who's also a pilot, and he's a really good shooter. His name is Warwick. Okay. And uh, he, he basically was with me for the first week. I was there for almost three weeks. Okay. And my family came out and visited for the last 12 days or so. And uh, um, there was really intense float training that ended with a beaver left seat checkout and that's the canadian made kind of legendary bush planes so that was sort of an epic thing to get to do oh, yeah. and then we did a whole bunch of real world missions with the beaver and uh, where my family came along we went to different camps and different lodges and different remote locations to really use the airplane we delivered some feed to a okay. hunt camp and my family came along for a day to visit there and and i flew into anchorage to pick them up and we took the airplane to denali um so yeah, the amount of that was a two terabyte raw footage <laughs> shoot. Insane. <laughs> and, you know, I did the shoot and then it was like everything else, like, you know, Oshkosh happened almost immediately after, I think. Oh, yeah. And then I just kind of organized the raw footage and put it on a shelf. And it was like the amount of time and effort it takes to just open and organize a project like that. Yeah. Well, I don't even know if it wasn't for this whole shutdown and pausing everything and stopping all my travel. I don't know that I would have even been publishing this yet, yeah, okay. frankly. Uh -huh. so, so being forced to only edit right now mostly allowed me to kind of get that dust blown off of that footage and get that published. So yeah. it kind of helped me out there. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, that's uh, that's, uh, that's uh, per perhaps uh, one of the, the, the positive things uh, of, of this whole crisis, but uh, yeah. Yeah, but uh, I can imagine the 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 the, the quantity, sheer quantity of, of such a project. Uh, it's really demotivating to 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 start on, on even sorting that stuff out, uh, right? It is. It is. Yeah. You get it starts off very intimidating yeah. and frustrating to just begin, yeah. but then once you're into it, yeah. it's it's exciting to remember all the great stuff we got. Yeah. And I mean, from that, I think I'm going to end up with eight episodes that'll be mixed. Okay. I did two back to back of the initial basic float training. That's what I just published, and then I'm going to take a minute to do a build vlog, and I'm going to do one that I just shot of that currency flight with the Harvard and the uh, helmet. Oh, yeah. I'm going to kind of talk about helmets and the value of flying with helmets, which even my instructor from Alaska is a big proponent of okay. any back backcountry stuff or anything. You really, even in a Cub, you really probably should wear a helmet. Yeah, okay. But definitely in a, in a Warbird, even a small mishap in a plane like the C6, yeah. you're going to hit your head. Even if it's a small mishap, yeah. okay. So a helmet is pretty critical for warbird flying. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I'm going to do that, and then I'll get back to the uh, series in June. I'll continue the Beaver and other training we did there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to those. Uh, I, I like well, basically, I like everything you put out. But uh, yeah, especially those, uh, those, I appreciate <laughs> those, those kind of things. Yeah, yeah. So uh, and uh, talking about special episode, uh, there, there are uh, a couple of episodes that that stick uh, out above the rest too, uh, in regards to uh, putting a message out. And I'm referring to those uh, cooperations you did with Dan Grider, right? And uh, actually, uh, I'll, I'll show you a picture of, of uh, what, what you did to my airplane in a positive sense of the word, but I'll, I'll get back to that later on. But uh, yeah, can, can you t talk a bit about uh, Dan Greider, uh, who he is and, and uh, what, what, what you did together? Yeah, Dan is an interesting character. I first met him at Osh, I can't remember if it was 17 or, I think it was 17, yeah. um, where we flew the DC-3 together. and. Um, he owns that airplane. He's a retired Delta captain, and uh, he's a very knowledgeable DC-3 pilot. He, he trains people to fly it, and uh, he's he's on a mission to kind of bring GA into the airline world in terms of 
training logic. So he's really working on a thing that's kind of called AQP, which is Advanced Qualification Program, which takes the nature of a check ride and puts, or even a flight review. So you're not going to necessarily work on the things that don't kill you. He really wants to focus on the trouble spots. And he doesn't really believe in steep turns and chandelles and things like that. Okay. It's it's more a case of slow speed recognition and noticing distraction and things like rejected takeoffs that we don't really like. When was the last time you practiced a rejected takeoff yeah. proper? Yeah, no, well, yeah, the, the the hardly, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. and go arounds yeah. like like really focusing on the go around. That's that's the thing that yeah. gets people. Yeah. Just something as simple as a proper takeoff briefing because yeah. yeah. that'll get you, that'll put you in a spot where. I mean, yeah, this is the case yeah. of a guy trying to do a... Oh, well, yeah. he just botched it. Yeah, unbelievable. Um, uh, he he yeah. spun it from... He, uh, this guy survived. Okay, but, okay. But uh, that, that, that's uh, yeah. loss of control. Yeah, yeah. Whatever cause of distractions. Yeah. So Dan's mission is to really talk about loss of control, accidents, and what causes them, VFR and IMC, the problem that I had early there, of like these things that you can yeah. prepare and train for. Yeah, exactly. And, and talking about defined minimum maneuvering yeah. speed just so that you can stay safe. And then also the minute that you have a problem, if you don't pre-brief that, you know, like for instance, my takeoff briefing, I always discuss where I'm at, how long the runway is, where my board point is going to be if I don't like my speed and so on. Um, and then also, are we going to consider the turn back at what altitude? Yeah, exactly. But the issue is if you don't pre-brief the plan, if you have an engine failure after takeoff, you can't begin to start thinking about what's the plan. Yeah, exactly. You have to immediately push the nose down. That's the first thing you have to do before anything else and keep your speed. Yeah. Uh -huh. Then you can maybe start working the problem. Yeah. But you can't work the problem and stop flying yeah. because it doesn't matter if you solve the problem while you're out of control and vertically falling out of the sky. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, Bob Hoover always said, if, it, if anyone doesn't know who Bob Hoover is, yeah. Yeah. You know, his book Forever Flying is amazing. Yeah. His, his he, I think he has the record for crashing the most airplanes, and that's not because he was a bad pilot. It's because he was a test pilot who brought them home. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah. So many other test pilots would either bail out or lose it, um, but he would figure it out, bring it home, and crash it. And his his sort of philosophy was fly it all the way to the crash. Yeah, exactly. And and even in this video, we did a, re a reenactment kind of thing of, of a spot where one of Dan's students lost their life, oh, yeah, yeah. having an engine. They had an engine failure at 300 feet, uh -huh. so we went right right to the same spot and simulated the engine failure, pushed the nose down. Yeah. And people in the comments kind of said, yeah, well look at that. There's trees. There's water. It's not pretty. Where are you going to put it? Yeah. It's like that doesn't matter. Yeah. The point is, even if you put it in the trees. You're flying it until you hit the trees. Yeah, exactly. And you're going laterally, so you're going to decelerate while smashing through trees. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. You might break a bone. Yeah. You might get some scrapes. Yeah. But you're probably not going to die. Yeah, exactly. However, if, if you lose control at 300 feet and spin it in vertically and hit the ground and decelerate in zero feet, mm -hmm. you will absolutely die. Yeah, exactly. So the question isn't where are you going to put it? If there's trees in this water, yeah. it's like either one. Yeah. It's better. To fly it all the way to that tree or water, yeah. and then yeah. and then you're going to hit it going forward laterally at 50 or 40 knots, however slow you can get it at that point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then you're going to decelerate while you're smashing through the fence, you're smashing through trees, whatever. The point is, you fly it all the way to the crash, stay in control. Yeah. And you have a much better chance of surviving than losing it. Yeah. And that that's kind of the philosophy that gets lost on a lot of people. It's like if you start spending time working on, you know, mags and doing your, your troubleshooting of your engine failure while you're still nose up, yeah, know. you're going to stop flying. Yeah, exactly. None of it matters if you solve the problem because you stop flying. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So now to the, uh, to, to the point, uh, what, you, what you did to my airplane, this, this picture, this is my airspeed indicator. I'm, I made a uh, defined minimum maneuvering speed marker. What do you think about that? <laughs> Looks fast. Is that really how fast your your minimum maneuvering no, speed is? No, that's uh, in the kilometers an hour. So. <laughs> oh okay. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. I so I'm like, wow. If the, these were nuts, then I would have a pretty yeah. uh, impressive airplane. So yeah, actually, yeah. Th this is this is uh, this is uh, a picture of my airplane uh, airplane panel before I uh, put in uh, the, the the DMMS marker. But yeah, I uh, I made it even uh, on a little label in my cockpit. Uh, so and uh, I'm trying to propagate uh, the, the the story behind uh, DMMS as well, because I think uh, it was such an eye-opener. Uh, the, 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 the difference between four GA pilots and four airline pilots, it, it was almost like uh, 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 just hilarious, like a minimum and maximum. Yeah, I mean, 
in some ways it's not fair because the term is kind of fundamentally different in the two worlds but dan's point is yeah. the idea of it being a maximum or a minimum and all the airline guys talk about it as a minimum and all the ga guys talk about it as a maximum but really what it fundamentally comes down to is if you have a, a speed like a holy grail speed that you will never allow yourself to get below yeah. that gives you a buffer of 30 yeah. percent protection while maneuvering yeah. because that's kind of key you need to be able to maintain a level turn and 30 degree bank so you can actually maneuver yeah exactly um yeah. that that speed will protect you from stalling yeah yeah. Provided you don't pull a bunch of G's, but yeah. I mean, do, doing a 30 degree rate one or a 30 degree bank turn at that speed, holding altitude will protect you, and that allows you to maneuver with or without power. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, yeah, having a mark it just kind of really removes the doubt and removes the, the question while you're flying along trying to solve problems and you're just looking at a needle yeah. on an airspeed indicator. Exactly. Not really thinking about what what speed do I need to maintain? Because if you think about VREF, yeah. That might be too slow mm -hmm. if you're trying to still turn base the final yeah. you might need to be faster than that yeah exactly yeah yeah so yeah that's uh everywhere i go i try to to convince people to do the same so uh, but uh, yeah so uh but uh yeah time runs fast so i think it's it's time to uh, to uh, start the q a uh, uh, uh part of the the episode so uh if uh, kevin the, one of the chat hosts can uh, sum uh, some of the questions uh uh up then uh, i'll uh, try to to ask them, let me see. Well, I'll ask them real quick. I see someone asking, when was the last time you didn't record a flight? Ah. That's a good question. It's, it's funny, almost most of the flights recently in the T6 I have not recorded. <coughs> and if you told me five, five years ago, you're going to be flying solo in a T6 yeah. and you're not going to bother filming it. Okay. Yeah. I would be like, what are you talking about? That's like the holy grail of like Warbird trainers. Yeah. Like if I got access to that, I'm going to film every drop. <laughs> but the fact is yeah. I'm maintaining currency in it. It's, it's business and it, sometimes it's a lot of work to get it in and out and get it pre-flighted and just spending the time to put cameras up. Oh, yeah. uh -huh. yeah. In that airplane, it's harder than, because uh, I have to put a bunch of cameras in the back seat that are the ones that are getting the audio and so on. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's just more work. If I'm flying solo, I just, I just set the back seat up with the stick out the seat belts are tied down and I shut the canopy and I go. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, most of the flying in the T6 I have not shot, which is crazy. The last flight I did because I flew with the helmet for the first time. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, that's been kind of weird to be able to say I can't believe I'm not filming the coolest airplane I ever <laughs> thought I could access to fly. Yeah, yeah. But you know, it comes down to the safety aspect and, and not if it's going to be a distraction or it's going to hamper my process i just have to throw the cameras away yeah. and not do it yeah exactly yeah okay so uh here are a couple of uh, questions so greg uh philpot uh, i hope i could uh, pronounce it correctly how is the rv uh, build coming uh yeah i mean it's going too fast i think it's part of the problem okay that's been that's been the joke we are quite close now to being ready to hang an engine okay and uh cool. We're, we're kind of making decisions about avionics and, and deciding how we're going to do all that. So it's, it's yeah, I'm going to be publishing one in the next week or so to catch up on that and kind of let you guys know where it's at. Okay. But it's canopy is installed, which is typically one of the very difficult parts of, of building. Oh, yeah. But the RV-14 is so precisely, uh, the kit is so well set up that it, it's, the guys that I'm working with have done it before. They've done multiple different airplanes and a couple sevens. They're like, this canopy is the cleanest, best, like all the seams are perfectly lined up. Normally there's like a couple of things that are like not quite perfect yeah. when you close it and you can tell the seams are a bit different oh, yeah. and the fit and finish isn't perfect. Yeah. Uh -huh. This is like, it's tight. It fits real nice. Okay. So yeah. Vans has said like, you can almost put one RV-14 canopy onto another airplane and it'll fit just because things are so precise. Okay. Wow. Normally it's very, very custom and sometimes it's asymmetrical, yeah. just how you have to do it. Yeah. So it closes perfectly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we're at that stage. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to to uh, to uh, to uh, uh, the next uh, build flux on on the RV14. Uh, so uh, this is a question of uh, Euro Aviators. Um, how do you experience the differences between the Canadian and American GA community? Are there any differences or differences at all? Uh, they call it a pattern. We call it a circuit. And back strike and back taxi. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think. I call it backtrack. I think I use the, the U.S. terminology because I'm so I'm in and out of both places. I want to say that I call it backtrack, but I'll have to look because on the latest video I did, that was the clearance I got because the airport was so quiet. Okay. I was on the short runway with the T6, and I like to do full stop landings. So um, on the long runway, I can stop and go. Okay. 
Um, but on the short runway, I can't really safely stop and go for sure. Okay. And when I start the takeoff roll, the nose is so high up, I can't see enough to be sure I have enough runway left, so I don't want to do it. Okay. So I got back tack or backtrack clearance, and uh, I'll have to look at the tape to see how I said it. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so those two terms are maybe different. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Otherwise, I mean, it's so similar that I don't think we even talk about the reg difference as much. They have more Bravo airspace around big airports, which we just have Charlie, but the uh, yeah, yeah. regs are the same. You can't enter a Bravo without the clearance yeah. explicitly saying enter the Bravo, yeah. and it's the same with the Charlie. Yeah. Uh, in Canada, Bravo starts above 12.5. Oh, yeah. In the States, that's different. Yeah. Um, they have Bravos at airports, but otherwise, it's pretty pretty much the same. Okay, yeah. Okay. Uh, this is a question of Ben Atkinson. Uh, he's a fellow YouTuber as well, Ben Atkinson Learning to Fly. And uh, his question is, uh, Steve, uh, is your main flying goal still to fly Spitfire? I mean, yeah, I got to say that that's the holy, holy grail of what I'm trying to yeah. do. Having said that, when I achieve it, it doesn't it doesn't mean everything's over, but um, that is that's a big one to be able to get to that point. And I don't want to just get a ride; I want to get the actual checkout. Okay. I don't know that I need to solo it. I don't even know that I'll get the offer to solo it. And frankly, even if I did, I don't know that I would want to. That's just a lot of stress. It's a very expensive relic, and uh, I think if a guy sits there and has his arms crossed in the other seat and says, "You're checked out. You did the flight. You're signed off." That's I'm fine to say I'm soloing a T6 whenever I want, yeah, and yeah. they tell me it's harder to fly than Spitfire anyway. Okay. And I just want to get the training and know that I'm signed off as a Spitfire pilot and then do that. Um, yeah. Just kind of honor my grandfather, honor those veterans. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that's a, that'll be pretty cool. That's an impressive goal, yeah. 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 So this is a, a question of another uh, aviation YouTuber. Uh, <laughs> this is a guy from England, uh, jo uh, Jodel Flyer. Uh, Steve, what is the most uh, amount of cameras you used uh, for flying sequences? I tend to max out at three. Oh yeah, I would say I'm always at three. Three is kind of a minimum. Okay. Um, I think the most elaborate thing we ever did probably was the Coast Guard thing, if you haven't seen that one, um, because it involved rigging cameras on the chopper. I had cameras in the water with me. We had cameras on the boat. I think when I was thinking that, we had 12 cameras to sync between all the DSLR, GoPros, and everything else that was going on. We had DSLR on board the helicopter. We had DSLR oh, yeah. in the water with me oh, yeah. and getting rescued by the hoist rescue training and... Uh, we did the pool training, intercut it with the actual exercise out in the ocean. Or, well, we did it in Lake Michigan to simulate like an ocean, and it was quite rough uh -huh. and cold. So it really did feel like we were out in the ocean, honestly, in Lake Michigan that day in October. It was pretty cold. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, 12. I think it was 12. 12. That was a lot to uh, to sink <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> in a, multi, a single multicam with 12 cameras in sync. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, unbelievable. Uh, cool. Uh, let me see. Oh, yeah, this is a question of Dutch Aviation Blog. This is Niels, uh, also an uh, aviation uh, YouTuber. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of uh, those uh, nowadays. No, this, he's, he's a buddy of mine, uh, actually. Uh, Steve, what airplane would you never fly? And what uh, would you consider getting your CPL? Uh, I, I would have answered the CPL question differently maybe a year ago, but <laughs> the, the rules changed in Canada where we can no longer give rides at the museum where I fly even as a volunteer. It used to always be that private pilots could do that because we weren't getting paid. It was a volunteer pilot, and then the, the pay, person paying was donating to the museum. The money never went to the pilot. But for whatever reason, the regs changed on that. So I can, I'm can, i still a crew member there to fly formation flying and ferry the airplanes, and I can take friends flying. Oh, yeah. But if a, if, a, if a person off the street walks in, donates to the museum, and wants to get an airplane ride, it has to be given by one of the commercial pilot members. Okay. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. I'm considering getting it for that reason, and maybe way down the road I would be a CFI, but I still consider myself a weekend warrior. Oh, yeah. Don't really feel like I have the authority to be a teacher. Okay. So uh -huh. maybe commercial for that in the future. Um, and then what would I never fly? Uh, I mean, I don't know. There's so many... I, I think I think I can't decide. Uh, I mean, something like a CB or whatever these things look like oh, they're, yeah, they're impossible. Oh, yeah, the tiny wing. Oh, yeah. But I, I don't think a, a two seat version exists anyway. Uh, uh, um, so uh, no, I don't know that there's anything I wouldn't. Uh, yeah, that's not really. I, I think I would have to look at it and then decide, yeah. do some training, and yeah, exactly. if it was something that was considered sketchy, yeah. like an MU2 or something, is that the twin engine that, that has the bad reputation? Uh, yeah, I guess so. It's got the short yeah, wings. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, yeah. But I mean, I would, I, I would look at who am I flying with and what am I learning about it. And yeah, yeah I, I don't know. I, I can't really answer the what wouldn't I fly. That's okay. Yeah. So uh, last, last question because uh, the, the time is running uh, real fast. This is from uh, another buddy of mine, Kevin Walters. Uh, what's your ultimate aviation related bucket list item? Perhaps that's, that's a bit of overlap with, with the Spitfire story, but... Yeah, I mean, I guess it's still, it, it does kind of relate directly to the Spitfire. I don't know, is there any other, I would, I would like to fly an F-18, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> I also, I, I've got some, I've had some opportunities to fly jets, Yeah. and almost every time they kind of describe it as a video game because it's so fast and it's so responsive, mm -hmm. and it's a lot of procedural stuff, but once you're going, it's like, it's, it's so fast, yeah. and you know, I like stick and rudder. Like, really, at this point, my favorite thing that I'm flying is the T6 oh, yeah. because it is such a, it's got everything working for it. It's big tailwheel, complex with retractable gear and constant speed prop and a supercharged radial. It requires very specific power setting. You can't just firewall it. Um, managing it is hard and, and lots to work on. And then flying it is just all stick and rudder, like, there is nothing in that airplane helping you. Yeah. You have to do it all yeah. yourself. Um, that, that, that to me is really flying, yeah. like stick and rudder, hardcore, yeah. you know, tailwheel, warbird. Uh, I like jets. I like managing complex aviation or uh, avionics, uh -huh. and that's going to be what's fun about what we'll do with the RV. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the RV will be a good blend of, of complex avionics that you would have in a jet, and really, really amazing autopilot type stuff, yeah. and set it up and it flies the whole flight for yeah. you and then you flick it off and then you can go do aerobatics and land a tailwheel on the grass yeah, yeah. so i feel like i feel yeah. like that kind of covers both worlds nicely yeah. like the t6 doesn't have really any avionics yeah. <laughs> um so yeah yeah i don't know that i answered that question exactly but that's yeah. yeah so if you want to ever fly a nice uh yellow low wing uh, uh and the, the, what uh, is something completely different then Perhaps we can have a <laughs> have a flight in this one. So this is this is my airplane. Did did you ever fly a microlight aircraft? I don't know if a sling counts as a microlight, yeah, but I've flown the sling. That, 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 I think it's uh, the uh, like the six hundred kilogram uh, category. So this is a maximum takeoff weight of a thousand pounds. Cool. Yeah. So uh, yeah. But yeah. Yeah. If uh, if you ever make it to uh, to Holland, then uh, perhaps you can uh, take this for the, for a ride and uh, film it uh, during the the way. So uh, yeah. But uh, I was supposed to be out there this year, man. Yeah. It's been it's been hard to cancel yeah. everything. Uh -huh. Yeah. I know. It's been a weird year. Yeah. It's gonna be a weird year. I don't know how long this is gonna be, but yeah. 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 yeah strange. We'll get there at some point. Twenty one, twenty two. I don't know, but it could be twenty twenty, yeah. unfortunately. But uh, the the invite still stands. So uh, if you want to place a place it. a crash, uh, it's it's all uh, all prepared. So you're more than welcome. So uh, yeah, yeah, cool. All right, thanks, man. Appreciate it. Yeah. So uh, I think this uh, this concludes the the the, the, the episode. I'm uh, running a bit late, uh, so uh, the, it's it's time to wrap this up. So uh, yeah, uh, I'm really glad you said yes uh, to this interview. So uh, many thanks uh, to uh, to you uh, to uh, to do this to to share the, somewhat of the background and the complete uh, history of, of flight jobs uh, with me and uh, my viewers. So uh, I really appreciate that. So thanks. Cool. Yeah, happy to do it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and also uh, to the viewers, of course, uh, thanks for watching, and I hope to uh, to uh, see you around uh, at the next um, for Fun Flyer Live uh, episode. And uh, yeah, if you have any uh, more questions, uh, please uh, drop them in the comments below. Uh, hit the, the the like button, etc. And uh, if you haven't subscribed to my channel, uh, uh, you're more than uh, welcome to do that. And uh, on the off chance you didn't subscribe to uh, Steve's uh, uh, channel, uh, the, all his contact details are in uh, in the description of this video as well. And also the link to your Patreon uh, website because. I'm a strong believer in, in supporting, uh, also uh, financial uh, supporting uh, content creators. I think it's, it's, it's well worth it. So uh, uh, if, if anybody isn't uh, a Patreon supporter of Steve, uh, please go ahead and do so. so. Yeah, appreciate okay. it. Okay. Well, thanks and uh, hope to, uh, to talk to you soon. All right, All right. man. Take it yeah, easy. Yeah, you too. Bye.